Hello again, and welcome to a return visit to the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel, uh, where we're following the life of David. We left him last time in chapter 29 in Ziklag, a Philistine town, in Philistine territory, enemy territory really, as far as the Israelites were concerned, and he'd been personally appointed to be the bodyguard of King Achish. How on earth was he going to get out of this dilemma? Well, there was going to be a set-piece battle between the Philistines and the Israelites. And Achish's senior men said, get rid of this David. When it comes to hard fighting, we can't rely on him to remain on our side. So Achish sent him away 50 miles back to Ziklag. When he got back there to, at Ziklag, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 30 now, Ziklag was a smoking ruin and his two wives and their children and all the, the, the families of the other soldiers had been abducted by the Amalekites. Cutting a long story short, David attacked the Amal Amalekites and he rescued all their wives and children and returned to Ziklag. After two days in Ziklag, a, the battle did take place. It's known as the Battle of Mount Gilboa in 1 Samuel chapter 31. And at that battle, Jonathan... David's close and loving friend died, and most of his brothers too. And Saul was wounded. But Saul didn't want the ignominy of being killed by a member of the enemy tribes, and so he took his own life by fawning on his sword. This might remind you of Judas Iscariot in the New Testament, taking his own life. When Saul's corpse was discovered, it was beheaded, and then his body was fastened to a wall in a town called Beth Shan. But later it was rescued by some Israelites from Jabesh Gilead and they cremated the body and they buried what remained. And in 1 Chronicles chapter 10 it says Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord and he even consulted a medium for guidance and did not inquire of the Lord. So the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David son of Jesse. So Saul now, the king, has died. And we've reached the end of the book of 1 Samuel, and we're moving now into the book of 2 Samuel. Now when these books were written, they were one book. They were only divided between the close of the Old Testament and the opening of the New Testament, because in those 400 years, most Jews weren't living in Israel. They were living in the, the diaspora, the dispersion. And they needed the Old Testament in a language they could read, Greek. So some scholars decided to translate the Old Testament into Greek, and when they did so, they divided the one book of Samuel into two, which is why we as Christians are used to 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Well, we're now in 2 Samuel chapter 1, and David hears news of the death of his friend and of his king. He's in Ziklag, and lo and behold, this, this uh, man turns up, he, he, he's been in the fight, he, he's dusty, he's dirty, he's, his clothes are torn, and there's dust on his head, he's in mourning, and he's come with what he thinks is good news, but David thinks is bad news. He bows down to David, and David asks him five questions. Question number one, verse three, where have you come from? I've come from the Israelites, from being with the Israelites, I got away from them. Question two, verse four, what happened? Tell me what happened at the battle. Well, he says, the Israelites fled and Saul and Jonathan are dead. Question three, verse five, how do you know? What is, I, I happen to be there. <laughs> I happen to be there. He was a scavenger. He had been scavenging among the dead Israelites for loot. And he was the first to come across the body of Saul. And he elaborated the story to his own destruction. He said that Saul had said, I'm wounded, I'm dying, please put me out of my misery. Please let me die with dignity. Please stab me so, I'm, so I'll die. That's not what happened at all. We know that from the book of 1 Samuel. But that's what this Amalekite said. He tried to write himself into history. And then he says, what, what I did get was some loot. Here's his crown and here's his armband. Well, this is the, the first time we ever hear in the Bible about kings of Israel having a crown. So he's hoping for some reward. I've killed Saul, your enemy. Here's his crown. What am I going to get? What a good boy am I? 
And in verses 11 and 12, we see David's grief. He tore his clothes, he mourned, he wept, he fasted. And then he asked the fourth question, question four, verse 13, where are you from? And he said, well, originally I'm an alien Amalekite. Question five, why weren't you afraid to destroy an anointed king? And David ordered his execution. David is so stricken with grief that he goes into a lament. And we have in chapter one, the first lament in the Bible. And I'm going to read it to you from the paraphrase, the living Bible. O Lord, your pride and joy lies dead upon the hills. Mighty heroes have fallen. Don't tell the Philistines, lest they rejoice. Hide it from the cities of Gath and Ashkelon, lest the heathen nations laugh in triumph. O Mount Gilboa, let there be no dew nor rain upon you. Let no crops of grain grow on your slopes, for there the mighty Saul has died. He is God's appointed king no more. Both Saul and Jonathan slew their strongest foes and did not return from battle empty-handed. How much they were loved, how wonderful they were, both Saul and Jonathan. They were together in life and in death. They were swifter than eagles, stronger than lions. But now, O women of Israel, weep for Saul. He enriched you with fine clothing and gold ornaments. These mighty heroes have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan is slain upon the hills. How I weep for you, my brother Jonathan. How much I loved you. And your love for me was deeper than the love of women. The mighty ones have fallen, stripped of their weapons and dead. A lament in the Old Testament is a poem, a bit like our eulogies. It's a formal expression of sorrow. It's a sad poem for sad people. In verse 19, he mentioned who has died, Saul and Jonathan. In verse 20, he said, don't let the Philistines find out about it. They'd know, of course, this is poetry. In verse 21 and 22, he brings a poetic curse on the mountain where they died. He said, oh, there would never be any rain there anymore or any moisture or any mist. And then he says in verse 23, Saul and Jonathan were powerful and highly regarded in life and now they've died together. And then in verse 24, he says, well, Israelite women, you had a good time of it. You were well off when Saul was king. You may be entering poorer times now. And in verse 25 and 26, David is broken hearted. He's lost his best friend. Their love had been better than in good marriage. But then David becomes king, but only in part. You may be familiar with a, a quiz programme on the television called QI. It's a general knowledge quiz. And there's one round in which questions are put to people and everybody knows the answers to these questions, but the answers that everybody knows are always wrong. And when the panel member says this answer, a klaxon sounds. Ni no, ni no. For example, question one. Where was Juliet standing when wooed by Romeo? And somebody says, she was on a balcony. Nino, Nino, Nino. There were no balconies in Elizabeth Elizabethan times. She was at a window. Question two. Who coined the phrase, elementary, my dear Watson? And a panel member says, Arthur Conan Doyle in the Sherlock Holmes stories. Nino, Nino, Nino. No, you do not find that phrase in any of the Sherlock Holmes stories. It was coined by P.G. Woodhouse. Now, here's one for you. Who was king of Israel after Saul's death? Who was the second king? And you say, David. And the klaxon sounds, Nino, Nino, Nino. No, it wasn't. The next king, as we're going to see after David, was a man called Ish-bosheth. Let's have a look at verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 2. In the course of time, David inquired of the Lord, shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah, he asked. The Lord said, go up. David asked, where shall I go? To Hebron, the Lord replied. So David went up there with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David also took the men who were with him, each with his family, and they settled in Hebron and its towns. Then the men of Judah came to Hebron, and there they anointed David king over the tribe of Judah. David is anointed. This is his second anointing. You remember Samuel had anointed him years before. Now he's anointed again 
but only as the king of one twelfth of the nation. He's anointed king of Judah only. And so for a number of years, God's anointed king is tucked away in the hills of Judah while the rest of Israel are carrying on their own ways. God's kingdom is tucked away in the hills of Judah. We'll return to that thought a little later. Now David learns that Saul and Jonathan's bodies had been rescued from Bashan and cremated and buried by the people of Ramoth Gilead. And he invokes a blessing on them. May the Lord show you kindness and faithfulness. And then Abner, who was Saul's commander-in-chief, decides to make himself kingmaker. Verse 8. Meanwhile, Abner, son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army, had taken Ishbosheth, son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. He made him king over Gilead, Ashuri, and Jezreel, and also over Ephraim, Benjamin, and all Israel. Ishbosheth, son of Saul, was 40 years old when he became king over Israel, and he reigned two years. The tribe of Judah, however, remained loyal to David. The length of time David was king in Hebron over Judah was seven years and six months. Abner appoints Ishbosheth, son of Saul, as the king of Israel, 11 twelfths. This puppet king, Ishbosheth, he's 40 years old, but it's Abner who is pulling the strings, and his reign only lasts for two years. Now, meanwhile, David's sister, Zeruah, you may remember, had three sons Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. We've come across Abishai before. Do you remember when David crept into Saul's camp and stole the javelin and the jug of water? Abishai was with him then. And Joab's name you will probably know because he becomes the commander in chief of David's men. We've got two kings here, haven't we? We've got a king, Ishbosheth, over 11 twelfths of the nation, and King David over 1 twelfth, the tribe of Judah. And in verses 17 to 23, conflict arises. <clears throat> I'm sorry, just before those verses, um, Abner and Joab had decided to have a representative skirmish. Each of those two generals chose 12 men, and they said, let them fight, and whichever side wins, we will either say Israel's won or Judah has won. What actually happened was that the 12 men all killed the other 12 men, and there was no clear outcome to that skirmish. Reading now from verse 17. Because after the skirmish, they just fell at each other's throats. All of them did. The battle that day was very fierce, and Abner and the Israelites were defeated by David's men. The three sons of Zeruiah were there, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel. Now Asahel was as fleet-footed as a wild gazelle. He chased Abner, turning neither to the right nor to the left as he pursued him. Abner looked behind him and asked, Is that you, Asahel? It is, he answered. Then Abner said to him, Turn aside to the right or the left. Take on one of the other young men and strip him of his weapons. But Asahel would not stop chasing Joab. Abner, sorry. Again, Abner warned Asahel, stop chasing me. Why should I strike you down? How could I look your brother Joab in the face? But Asahel refused to give up the pursuit. So Abner thrust the butt of his spear into Asahel's stomach and the spear came out through his back. He fell there and died on the spot. And every man stopped when he came to the place where Asahel had died and fallen. Asahel, we know from other scriptures, mainly chronicles, was one of David's mighty men. He was one of the 30, and he was also David's nephew. So there's a family relationship here between Asahel and David, as well as a professional relationship. Asahel was a sprinter, and he was determined to get Abner. And as he ran at Abner, Abner shoved his the spear into Asahel, and Asahel died. Once that happened, the tribe of Benjamin, in particular, rallied behind Abner. And, of course, the tribe of Judah was rallying behind um, 
Joab, and the two generals decided to call a truce. Verse 26. Abner called out to Joab, Must the sword devour forever? Don't you realise that this will end in bitterness? How long before you order your men to stop pursuing their fellow Israelites? Joab answered, As surely as God lives, if you had not spoken, the men would have continued pursuing them until morning. So Joab blew the trumpet, and all the troops came to a halt. They no longer pursued Israel, nor did they fight any more. Abner and Joab agree to a truce. Joab blows the trumpet and the fighting ceases. The previous skirmish had turned into a real battle. This real battle turns into a truce. And we're told at the end of the chapter that Joab had lost 20 men, 20 of David's men are from the tribe of Judah. But Abner had lost 360 men, all from the tribe of Benjamin. And then Asahel was buried in Bethlehem of all places, and Joab's men returned to Hebron, which was David's capital. Now it says in Romans chapter 15 that everything was written in the past, the Old Testament, everything was written in the Old Testament, that by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now how can we look at these two chapters and gain any hope or blessing from them? And I think there's an important one in chapter 2 at the beginning sorry, in chapter 1, where David laments over the death of Saul and Jonathan. Do you know there is an increase in this country in pure cremations? A pure cremation is one where there's no service, no ceremony. The corpse is taken by the undertaker to the creme. The creme burns the corpse and there's no, uh, no kind of ceremony, there's no gathering, there's no congregation, nothing at all to mark the end of that person's life. In the Church of England, in the 10 years up to 2018, clergy-led funerals fell by 29%. And in the year 2019, there were 14,000 fewer clergy funerals than there had been in 2018. Fewer and fewer people are turning to the church to bury them. Why is this? It's because, by and large, the population as a whole have cast off Christianity. They're not interested in Jesus. They don't believe in God, not the God as we understand him of the Bible. And no one can handle death. And therefore, they make up a religion of their own and sayings of their own. They say things like, well, granddad has gone to be with Jesus. Or there's a new star in the sky, look up there tonight and our loved one is there shining, twinkling in the sky. Or, or there's a new angel in heaven now. <clears throat> I'm sure you've all heard of the calamity between the sub-postmasters and the post office who swindled the postmasters out of so much money and some of them went to prison for thefts which had not been thefts, the Horizon case. And one of these postmasters died and his widow said, I am determined to tell him that justice has been done when we meet at the end of the rainbow. Where did she get the idea from that she was going to meet her dead husband at the end of the rainbow? A 90-year-old said, I've had all I wanted out of this world. I'm quite happy to go and meet my little puppy dog waiting there for me. Where did she get the idea that she's going to be meeting up again with her dear little puppy dog? People are making up their own religion. They're making up their own faith. They're making up their own beliefs. Shakespeare put it beautifully when Horatio said to the dead Hamlet, Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. King Charles quoted that of his mother when she had passed away. Good night, sweet prince, flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Beautiful words, but is there any reality to them? What does the Bible say about dying? It says this in Hebrews chapter 9. People are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Oh dear, that puts a different face, a different complexion upon a bereavement, doesn't it? When that person has died, they've gone to God to be judged. You go to an English funeral, and if there is a, a, um, a statement, an oration about the dead, the, summa, the summary of it will be, didn't they do well? Well, I tell you, God's judgment will tell whether that person did well or not. 
we need to lament. We need to grieve. We need to sorrow when somebody has died and not to make up silly stories um, like puppy dogs meeting at the end of the, ra at the rainbow or something. Jesus lamented when he came to a tomb of his friend. He burst into tears at that grave. When the first Christian martyr died, it says the godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him in Acts chapter 8. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, do not grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. He was explaining the idea of resurrection and the return of Jesus. That's what happens on the other side of the grave. Groucho Marx said, dying is the last thing I want to do. John Wesley said of his Methodists, our people die well. And you know, hymn writers have written verses for us to help us prepare ourselves for dying. Take the cup final hymn. Hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee. In life, in death, O Lord, abide with me. And Matt Redmond more recently has written, And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come, still my soul will sing your praise unending 10,000 years and then forevermore. You see, the scriptures give us a reason for facing the grave optimistically because we know we're going to rise from the dead and we're going to see Jesus Christ risen from the dead with our own eyes. We do have hope beyond the grave. But we still miss the people when they've gone. We, like David, lament, but we do not lament as those who have no hope. We have hope of resurrection. We have hope of the return of Christ. And then in chapter 2, there are blessings we can get from that chapter two, uh, that chapter as well. It says at the first verse, In the course of time, David inquired of the Lord. David had lost Samuel, dead. He lost his brother, his friend, Jonathan, dead. He lost his king, Saul, dead. What was he going to do now? Where was he going to turn? He didn't rush to judgment. He took his time. He wouldn't make a move without seeking the guidance of God. What a good example that is for us. When we come to a junction in our lives, when we come to a turning point, a fork in the road of our journey, we need to say something like this, thy way, not mine, O Lord. However dark it be, lead me by thine own hand. Choose thou the path for me. I dare not choose my lot. I would not if I might. Choose thou for me, my God, so shall I walk aright. At critical moments in your life, follower of Jesus, like David, in the course of time, seek God's will and submit to it. Another blessing we can get from this is the fact that the anointed king lived obscurely in the hills of Judah for seven and a half years. David was only king over one twelfth of the nation. The other eleven twelfths were going away doing their own thing. Wasn't there another anointed king who lived obscurely in the plains of Galilee for 30 years before he burst onto the public scene when he was baptised by John the Baptist? And isn't that same anointed king today reigning unseen in heaven, ascended at the right hand of God in the glory of heaven? There he is, but we can't see him. We can't hear his voice. We have to trust and believe. Charles Wesley said, He sits at God's right hand till all his foes submit and bow to his command and fall beneath his feet. His kingdom cannot fail. He rules our earth and heaven. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus given. We soon shall hear the archangel's voice. The trump of God shall sound. Rejoice! In the book of Revelation, John said, I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the centre of the throne. What a remarkable scene. The centre of God's throne occupied by a lamb. And we know that lamb to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ today reigns 
All authority on heaven and earth has been given to him. He reigns unseen. He reigns in obscurity, if you like. But he will not be obscure forever. He will not be invisible forever. Because one day, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue acknowledge and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. No wonder we don't lament as those who have no hope. We lament, but we lament in the knowledge that our bodies are going to be raised and we're going to see Jesus Christ, who will come out of obscurity into public gaze when everyone will acknowledge that he and he alone is Lord. To his glory. Amen.